For this month's chemical vocabulary focus, we're going to look at the language of electrostatic attractions and where we need to be using that in A-level chemistry for a range of different explanations. So one thing we need to realise is that majority of interactions in chemistry, I would say probably all interactions in chemistry, are caused by electrostatic forces of attraction between oppositely charged particles. Now, in physics, we may have done electrostatics and we, you know, the classic idea of a balloon sticking to a jumper because they're charged. We need to get a bit smaller for chemistry and start to think about what particles are attracted together in different circumstances. So we know that it's any oppositely charged species. So we could be talking about the protons in the nucleus being attracted to electrons. And we're normally talking about attraction to outer electrons in chemistry because those are the things that are lost and gained and shared in chemical reactions. We could also be looking at bonding like ionic bonding would be the attraction between oppositely charged ions. Metallic is between ions and electrons. And even intermolecular forces are often caused, or in fact always caused, by some sort of electrostatic force of attraction. If you haven't done about polar molecules, instantaneous and induced dipoles yet, don't worry about this one for the moment. In this video, we're therefore going to focus on the language we should be using and how we can use the idea about forces of attraction to explain different chemical trends that we see. And the main thing here is, of course, that a stronger force of attraction between charged particles is going to need more energy to overcome that force. And there are factors that affect the strength of an electrostatic force of attraction. One of them is going to be distance. So just like any other sort of non-contact attractive force like gravity, you're going to get a decrease in the strength of the attraction as the distance increases. And for that, we could be talking about the distance between electrons and the nucleus, or we could be looking at the distance between two ions, which depends on the size of the ions. We also should know, of course, that the electrostatic attraction increases as charge increases. Now, again, we could be talking about the charge on a nucleus in an atom, or we could be talking about the charge on an individual iron. There is one other point that's not quite so obvious, which is quite important in a lot of areas of chemistry, which is the idea of electron shielding. So this is the idea that when you add extra shells of electrons between the outer electrons and the nucleus, then you not only increase the distance between the outer electrons and the nucleus, but you also get this increased repulsive effect because you've got more negative charges in between your outer electrons and the nucleus. And you're getting a screening of the electric field of the attraction that those protons are exerting. And so that shielding effect is also going to reduce the electrostatic forces of attraction. We don't normally have to explain shielding, but we often have to mention it. So let's look at an example where we will have to use these ideas about forces of attraction to explain, first of all, the trend in reactivity as you go down group two. So the first thing with this kind of question is to think, well, what do group two metals have in common? They all lose their outer shell electrons because they're metals when they react. And that means if there's a difference in reactivity, then that is related to how easy or difficult it is for the atom to lose its outer shell electrons. So we also need to look at electrostatic attractions and we need to consider the things we just talked about, which would be the distance, the charge and the shielding. We need to look at what changes as we go down the group. So one thing that changes is nuclear charge i.e. the number of protons in the nucleus, increases. Now this is true, but that would actually, in theory, make the electrons more strongly attracted to the nucleus. So you have to look at what else changes as well. There are more electron shells. 
And because of this, there are two things that happen. This means there is an increased distance, and we know distance is important, and we need to be super specific here. The distance is between the outer shell electrons and the nucleus. And that is quite an important point because, of course, some of the electron, other electrons will not have a change or they may even be closer. And then as well as that, we also have an increased shielding due to those extra electrons in the inner shells. These two effects will have a net result in that the attraction between the outer electrons and nucleus is reduced or weaker. So we are linking the ideas of charge, distance and shielding to the idea of a force of attraction. I'm going to put in brackets despite increasing nuclear charge. Once we have talked about forces of attraction, we now need to link them to energy. So we can say less energy required to remove these electrons, to overcome that force. And because of that, this means that reactivity increases, because if you need less energy for a process such as a chemical reaction to take place, it is more likely to happen and the element will be more reactive. OK, so that's reactivity trends. If you have covered the atomic structure topic in detail, you've also had to answer many questions about ionisation energy. And we can answer these using ideas about attraction and forces as well. So the first thing we'd have to explain about this graph is that first ionisation energy shows a general increase, although there are little ups and downs, across a period from left to right. So thinking about what is changing, each element has one more proton in the nucleus. So as you go across the periodic table, there are more protons in the nucleus. We should also think about what's the same. So for example, uh, they will have the same shielding effect and that is because they're in the same shell these electrons that are being added, the outer electrons are staying in the same principal energy level or shell. So there's no extra shielding, there's no extra shells between the nucleus and outer electrons. So this results in an increased attraction. I have no idea why my pen keeps deleting itself. Increased attraction. Again, we're going to be specific between outer electron and nucleus. So more energy to overcome this attraction. So again, we've talked about what changes. Distance does not change. If anything, distance gets smaller. More protons, so more charge. Same shielding, more attraction. First ionization energy also decreases as you go down a group. So, for example, if we looked here between helium, neon and argon, you can see a trend going down. And so why we're doing that again, this is very similar to our group two reactivity because it's the same explanation. Really, we do have an increase in nuclear charge, but more important than that, we have more shells. Which means the outer electron is further from the nucleus. So we've got distance and we have more shielding, therefore decreased attraction. I'm going to run out of space here, but please make sure that you're writing decreased attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons and therefore less energy to overcome this attraction. Always make sure at some point that you're talking about outer electrons when you're talking about first ionization energy. Finally, we've got a decrease between group two and group three. So magnesium to aluminium 
beryllium to boron. So we're going in the same shell here, but we've still got a decrease going on. So we no much point talking about the number of protons increasing uh, because that would you would expect ionization energy to increase. So it's going to be about distance. You need a bit more information about atomic structure to understand this. And it is because for group two, the electron is being taken from the S subshell. And for group three, it's taken from the P subshell. And the P subshell is further from the nucleus. You can also say higher in energy. These two terms are kind of interchangeable because when we say further from the nucleus, we mean it's at a higher energy level. Further from the nucleus, and so there we have that reduced attraction between the outer electrons and the nucleus, and therefore less energy to overcome. Finally, we're going to look at melting points. So we're going to have a look at two different types of compound for this, or two, sorry, two different substances, not compounds. So metals, explain why aluminium has a higher melting point than sodium. When explaining this, we consider like we did before for like group two and everything else, when we're doing a comparison, what's the same, what do they have in common and what is different about the two substances? And that's a great thing to do when considering any comparison of melting points. So what is the same is that both of these substances have metallic bonding. And you've really got to learn your definitions for what metallic bonding is, because it will make answering these questions so much easier. So, and every time we describe bonding, we want to talk about electrostatic attractions, and then we identify the positive thing and the negative thing. So it's between the metal cation, positive iron, and the delocalized electrons. And it's a large lattice arrangement so these electrostatic attractions go all the way through and the strength of these attractions will therefore determine the melting point. So although aluminium and sodium both have that structure of cations and delocalized electrons, the difference is the group and therefore the outer shell electrons and therefore charge. So sodium is in group one and it will form a plus one iron, whereas aluminium is in group three, so forms a plus three iron. That means that the aluminium, aluminium three plus, has a greater charge, so stronger electrostatic attractions, and therefore more energy to overcome. Always remember to put in the part about energy because energy is not exactly the same thing as melting point. So there's usually a mark in a question about melting point for linking amount of energy to overcome forces to the melting point increasing. Finally, let's look at an ionic compound. So magnesium chloride has a higher melting point than magnesium bromide. Once again, we're gonna consider what they have in common and what they have different. So they're both ionic compounds. And that means they have electrostatic attractions throughout a lattice between, and this time we need to say what is what the two charges are, so we can just say between oppositely charged ions, or you could say between cations and anions. So what's also the same about them is the magnesium ion, so there's no point talking about the magnesium ion because the, both compounds have that ion. So the difference is the chloride and the bromide ion. Again, still think about what is the same about the chloride ion and the bromide ion. So Cl- and Br- have the same charge. They're both in group 7, 
So they're both going to form a minus one charge. And notice that I've written Cl minus and Br minus. Um, I have not just written Cl. I certainly wouldn't want to write Cl2. And I don't really want to say chlorine. I want to say chloride or bromide in these types of questions. Do be careful you're using the right language. So they have the same charge, but uh, Cl minus is smaller and has fewer shells. So the chloride ion is smaller. Uh, you could also say a smaller ionic radius. Be super careful. Don't use the term atomic radius here. This means that because it's smaller, it's about distance. But we're not talking now about the distance between electrons and the nucleus, although that is smaller because we're not talking about electrons being attracted to the nucleus. We're talking about an anion being attracted to a cation. So what it means is that the interionic, this is a great little term you can use to make life easier, interionic distance is smaller for MgCl2 than MgBr2. So the attractions are stronger and more energy to overcome or to break those bonds. So interionic just means between ions. You could say the distance between Mg and Cl minus or Mg2 plus and Cl minus is smaller than the distance between Mg2 plus and Br minus, but that's quite a long thing to write. Notice also that when I'm shortening and I'm talking about the compounds and I'm putting the formula, I'm putting the correct formula. Don't just write MgCl and start taking away a load of marks there because you've used the wrong formula for a compound.